welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As I did mention that we are now on our last panel for the day discussing renewable energy as a driver of economic recovery. And um, truly, that's, uh, I think, a question that is at the tip of our lips is how can we ensure that enough investment uh, is um, you know, drawn towards renewable energy and the sector is capacitated not only just to boost the economy, but also for mass employment, as previously mentioned by um, our ministers earlier on. Um, we are joined again by Valerie Gien. Uh, Gien. <laughs> there we go. I did it well the, the second time around there, Valerie. Thank you very much. Um, please do us the honor of introducing uh, your panelists. And uh, yeah, starting uh, this discussion, we've got about 30 minutes left. And uh, we look forward to engaging with you further. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Taban. I think uh, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, so I'm going to quickly introduce our next panel of speakers and get right into it. Uh, we've got Group CEO of DPA Africa, Mr. Norman Moyo. Um, and then we have Keith Cassie, who's wearing different hats. He's president of the South African Energy Efficiency Confederation as well as senior manager at uh, Standard Bank. And we have Buyo Ndoy, who is a co-managing director for, um, and deals a lot with investment and infrastructure, especially in the static region. And then Mr. Andrew Van Zale, who has an interesting background in various areas of work, um, as a qualifications in engineering and commerce, uh, involved in both the production and project uh, roles in mining, rail, mineral assets, and so on. So I think we've got a rich uh, combination of, of people and skills and knowledge here uh, to answer this question of, is renewable energy the panacea for us all? How is it going to assist us in driving the um, economic recovery? And there were a lot of what and how and when and who kind of questions in our previous panel. So I'd like you to build in a little bit of that. You know, what do you foresee as the opportunities, but also what might hold us back in seeing renewable energy as a driver of economic recovery? Uh, so can I start with Norman? Valerie, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you like to pick short men, yeah? Why did you have to start with me? <laughs> Good, I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, we can hear you. Fantastic, fantastic. I think to a quick response to that, uh, Valerie, is that uh, I think there is a need to embrace the shift that has happened in the energy space in, the, in South Africa in particular. But even more importantly, the, the value that energy plays in the ecosystem for a, a nation to turn around. It is probably one of the very fundamental infrastructure probably a lot more important than, shall we say, roads, without sounding very uh, contentious. But without energy, an economy can actually not take off. And we have lost 30 years of traction in trying to build, to keep up with the demands for energy in this country. So we are nearly 30 years behind. Now we are in a space where we need to leapfrog all the gaps that has been created by creating a new alternative, or better still embracing these new technologies to be able to leapfrog and stabilize the energy situation. So we lost 30 years, we really need to fix everything in the next three years or else the economy will go into gold drops. Thank you. Okay, I'm not going to comment, I'll leave my comments for later, but thank you so much for a very succinct message, uh, Norman. Shall we go on to Keith? uh thanks uh thanks thanks Valerie. thanks thanks for having me over here uh yes you know definitely i personally believe in a in a sustainable future for africa and i was looking at the african development bank and the potential that they spoke about within africa 10 terawatts could come from solar 350 gigawatts from hydro 110 gigawatts from wind and 15 gigawatts from geothermal it sounds as if Africa is this uh, sleeping powerhouse, a power giant who will probably never woke up, 
So the scene is set, we've got the potential, and uh, leadership has set forth a plan. And uh, yesterday, I don't know if you remember, Valerie, that I had to tell you that I had a power issue, and I, 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 I might have not been able to make today's discussion because I was afraid the batteries in my uh, uninterrupted power supply might have went off. So, yes, you know, we're still struggling with our current setup, and we're engaging in conversations about more power. And indeed, we need more power. It enables growth. I, I, I love what Norman was saying. I completely agree. It creates jobs. It gives, uh, and, and you know what? It gives mother, and, and you know what? If you do it renew, with renewable energy, Mother Earth can have a break. Uh, we can reduce pollution. We can improve air quality. And we could potentially even save lives. But you know what? Power costs money, unfortunately. And, 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 and money, I, I wonder who has. Because recently we went into a junk status, you know? And, 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 and you, add this, you add that to an economic downturn brought about by the coronavirus. You know what? Currently, I'm grateful I have a job. I just want to be honest over there, right? Because this is the context that we are. But one thing I did see uh, uh, from all of this that's going on is that, number one, we're resilient. We, we are resilient people. We've, we've managed to do with what we've got. I've managed to still be on the show with a little bit of power inside my batteries over there. And we, we, we are innovative. You know, something that, that, that this has shown us is that we're innovative in terms of how we actually do things. And this conference, you can see as it is, we're, we're, we're all digital and we have changed. So my, my, my take out from the plan and how we should go further is that, you know what? Before we start talking about more power and not, not before, correction, while, while we're still talking about more power, we've got to follow on the lessons that we've just said and we've got to make the most of what we've got. You know, are we really making the most of what we've got currently? And, and that's why, you know, uh, being in the energy efficiency space, and I'm wearing that energy efficiency hat, you know, energy efficiency should be seen as the first step. It should be the foundation, it should be the way we currently do things uh, as we continue in our discussions. And, and, and in doing that, embrace the innovation and in, in terms of our daily lives and how we do it. And, and I know renewables are great and there's a lot of innovation in funding and private sectors have come on to this. But there's so much potential with energy efficiency to, 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 to help us in our daily lives because we've got problems now that sometimes infrastructure will solve, yes, in the future, and there's a lot of ways for us to do it and there's great ways that even the private sector, like it's Standard Bank, as you mentioned, you know, we're coming to the party, but, you know, why not take some of this into the efficiency? Because, you know, the innovation we've, we've seen, we can do it. And uh, the third thing is that we've changed, you know, we, we've managed to do it and we've done it before. I really believe we can do it again. We can embrace innovation. Uh, as much as we talk about renewables, let's talk about the other aspects as well. Efficiency is another way for us to actually do this much faster. And value come from the, uh, you know, Th that same space earlier, you know. Uh, so yeah, that's me. Sorry if I took too long. Thank you so much, Keith. And I'm glad you reiterated what Barry said in the previous session. Uh, we'll also, I'd like to also come back to that word efficiency. I think it it can get lost in the sexiness of renewable energy. But let's hear our next speakers. So can I hand over to Buyo? Um, thank you very much, Val, um, and uh, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a great pleasure to, um, to be um, on this panel uh, with uh, my esteemed colleagues, and uh, I'd like to uh, agree with Keith and Norman on uh, the sentiments he's uh, already expressed. Um, just to highlight that AIM, uh, which is the company I head, which uh, sits within the old mutual group, is heavily invested in the energy and renewable sector and we're the largest single investor in the renewable energy IPP process in South Africa. Um, we also have a number of um, renewable or um, off-grid um, energy efficiency solutions across the continent. So one of our portfolio companies is actually less a renewable energy company and more uh, an energy efficiency play because uh, we believe in the holistic solution. Uh, there's no point in going renewable when a lot of that renewable power is going to waste. So uh, we we offer uh, 
um, uh, commercial clients uh, a holistic solution that includes um, across the board efficiency solutions, particularly in cooling, which is uh, a more important uh, uh, power uh, power um, require requirement uh, in other parts of the continent which have warmer climes. Um, I just wanted to say that indeed renewable energy is 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 a catalyst for economic recovery. I think uh, if you look at um, how quickly deployed renewables are versus other energy sources, uh, the impact is both from a construction perspective, where jobs are created in the construction of uh, of new uh, plants, and uh, and uh, um, that that that's a positive impact that can be achieved quite quickly because. The environmental and other approval processes around renewables are that much quicker. Um, from an economic impact perspective as well, just having more power, uh, as, as previously mentioned, is positive for the economy. Um, it allows for others to invest as well. Um, and I think embracing the green economy is, 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 is a potential holistic um, fill-up for um, the entire economy. Um, I think we also have to be a bit more programmatic about how renewable energy is delivered. Um, there needs to be certainty that uh, certain quantities will be delivered over time. What that allows is for um, upstream activities such as manufacturing uh, for the sector to uh, establish themselves uh, in country. I, I know a number of manufacturers closed shop recently because there was stop start uh, procurement processes in the renewable sector in South Africa. Um, so I think the more programmatic we are, the more of a catalyst for recovery of renewables becomes. Um, I think allowing the private sector to self-provide as well is also a quick fill-up because uh, uh, implementation can be quick and uh, obviously it needs to be checked because you don't want massive grid migration given that you've got a utility that you want to uh, almost keep uh, in, in one piece. Um, but maybe just to close off, given the, the, the time limit, it's important to highlight that uh, COVID has highlighted uh, the weaknesses uh, in our government balance sheets uh, around um, you know, treasury guarantees and the like. And uh, I think it highlights the importance for us to have uh, sustainable SOEs, uh, in this case, ESCOM. Uh, and uh, I think. Um, a move to uh, renewables as the new energy source. Uh, and given that we expect um, pricing to be south of the 70 odd cent mark uh, in further rounds of the renewable process means that uh, there can be a sustainable surplus for um, ESCOM to uh, sort of uh, improve its balance sheet position. Maybe not completely uh, remove uh, the problems it has, but somewhat offset um, the pressure it's putting on the entire fiscal. I'll close at that and uh, maybe speak to more ideas later. Thanks. Thank you very much, Vuyo. Uh, you are all spot on. Thank you so much. And it's probably my fault. I speak too much. So, Andrew, I'm going to ask you to come on board and then we'll throw out some questions based on what I. Okay. Thanks, Phil. <clears throat> Yeah, so I think, uh, I, I mean, I agree with uh, what's been said before. Um, I think what's interesting for me, you mentioned actually before we came on, on online about complexity. Um, and I think what we have is a, a very complex environment where we're seeing rapid technological change. We're seeing rapid changes, not so much on the energy side in terms of, uh, you know, wind and solar is still, are still, but they're making rapid progress. Um, there's, there's rapid advances in efficiency. There's improvements in cost. Um, we're obviously learning a lot about project execution, about installation, about connecting to grids, about balancing grids. Um, there's been a huge amount of progress on the mining side around uh, hybrid power plants. Um, so those are some quite exciting developments. Um, efficiency, certainly on the mining side, we're always very cognizant of, uh, you know, there's, uh, it's always better not to have to drive a kilometer than, um, uh, than find some other way of, of doing it. You know, any kilometer avoided and any ton that you don't have to move is, is is always a focus for us. Um, and I think also what's intersecting with that, though, is, is we, we obviously live in a very complex social environment. Um, so, so what we have as a, as, as a nation and as a continent, we, ha we, have a, uh, we have a lot of stakeholders to interact with. We have people who are um, obviously very dependent on, on coal. Um, 
but we have a number of people that we can bring into economic activity through renewables. Um, so, so, and given the pace of change that's both required and becoming possible, it's going to be quite a challenge to sort of balance regulation, to balance stakeholder engagement. Um, you know, we talk about a just transition and, and that's absolutely an imperative, but, but to actually sort of manage those, those moving parts, um, when the parts can move a lot faster than what a lot of us are comfortable with, is going to be a real challenge for us. But I think if I could make one, you know, one key point, I think what's exciting for me though is that I think most of the best economic solutions are also the environmentally attractive solutions um, currently. And, and so I, I'm seeing a lot of potential for us, uh, you know, to, I, I think distributed generation is, is going to be um, with renewables and, and some of the new storage technologies that are developing. I think that that is going to be something that becomes established in Africa. I think economically it makes a lot more sense. I think time to delivery is, is, is what we need or is, is much shorter. Um, it reduces the amount that has to be financed. I think it makes the credit a lot simpler. Um, it makes it uh, available to more people. And I, I think as we see a critical mass um, across the continent, I, I think you'll, you'll find that it becomes accessible at a, at a low enough level um, that, that, that we, we start to get rapid penetration and, and a, a rapid increase in, in installation. And, and I think, you know, as, as was pointed out, we are a resourceful continent. Um, so I think when we give people uh, opportunity and, and, and there's actually potential and there's economic uh, opportunity for a one megawatt installation, we'll find that people find a way to make use of that and, and find a way to make it work and create business from that. Um, it's really about getting that critical mass to where these smaller installations become possible and we, and we, we can take advantage of that resourcefulness. Um, thank you. <laughs> I was unmissing myself. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I, I, and thank you to all of you for your very short, but as I said, very succinct points. Um, I want to just tie in uh, what you said with what the previous um, panel said, because we're both dealing with sustainable energy, although from different vantage points. So maybe drawing from the previous panel, uh, one or two questions that I'd uh, like to ask, and maybe perhaps just to quickly sum up what I've heard you saying. I think uh, Norman starts out by saying we've lost too much time. We've got to move on. The world's going to leave us behind, and we've got all this um, potential and opportunity, and we've got to seize the moment. And then I think there was the whole question of, well, we're resilient. We've got what it takes. We're innovative. We've somehow weathered the storm of COVID. Uh, but of course, don't lose sight of what we've learned from efficiency. Uh, don't do renewable energy just because it's a fair, do it because you need it. Uh, and still be efficient, even in the use of renewable energy. And then I think the, um, the issue of, of uh, time, that you know, time is not on our side, but despite it not being on our side, we also still have to go carefully. So it's you know, a juxtaposition between catching up, hurrying up, catching up on time, but at the same time, being programmatic, as you said, and uh, moving with uncertainty. Um, and certainty not as in will renewable work or not, but certainty in terms, I think the previous group who talked about structural arrangements. What are the structural arrangements that will give us certainty as investors or people that are looking for jobs or looking to create new businesses? So that's a, a, a summary of, of some of the things I heard. But I'd like to come back to you then with questions from the previous panel that I think would be useful for you to also look at. How does this very exciting, what looks like a very exciting opportunity for us to embark on uh, renewable energy as, a, as part of our economic recovery, how does it need to take cognizance of society at large? Where is the role for society? And, and I think Andrew mentioned that complexity also lies in our social uh, um, network. So how do we address the problem of making sure that as we want to leap forward, we don't leave society behind, whether it's through social benefits, through jobs, or through um, participation, or through impact. Um, then another question I have, and I'm throwing the questions open to any of you to answer. Uh, something that was also brought up in the previous session was the, the question of life cycle. 
uh, that we're looking at energy from beginning to end and cradle to cradle, if, if you like. So the whole idea of a circular economy when we're talking about energy, where do we stand in terms of renewable energy and does it present us with more opportunity? And even in the challenges, are there solutions that can create some benefit for us? And um, I guess the whole word of embracing. Embracing for me, uh, having worked in the space for quite a long time, we're talking about working with people. How do we get people to embrace change uh, that's going to impact their lives in one way or another? So that question, those questions are open to any of you to answer as you see fit. Uh, who'd like to go for it? I'll go first, Valerie, since you chose me first. I have to stay first. Okay. Right. Right. Um, I will answer the society piece. Uh, and for, for, from a very deliberate, um, we, we, we are in distributed energy, and distributed energy is about a new form of energy that we had not embraced in the continent to date. But it's a, it's, it's a space that creates what we call prosumers. So you are a pro producer and you're a consumer at the same time. So the entire society, whether you're looking at the 650 million Africans who've got no access to energy today, they can start becoming producers and consumers of energy. They can even produce it for their own consumption and they can actually be able to sell it. Uh, the beauty of crisis is it, it creates an opportunity for invention and you never waste away such crisis. And necessity, they say, is the mother of invention. So every primary school in Africa can now generate energy and even feed it into the grid or power the next door building. Every building in the city should be able to now generate its own energy for its own consumption. In the process, we are creating jobs. In the process, we are improving the cost of energy. That means profitability for the businesses. In the process, we are actually reinventing and cleaning up our environment. So for me, energy is probably one of those few catalyst infrastructure investment that really touches every aspect of our society, including rural Africa, which until now had been completely neglected. We worry about energy when we have got a load shedding. We forget that some people for 100 years have not had power. Trust me, energy is a, is a vital human need. Even the most remotest grandmother could do with some television and some cold Coca-Cola. It's a fact. So we believe there is a new opportunity to create these prosumers. And so both the private sector and the public sector needs to come together and make this ecosystem work. I couldn't have said it better. Thank you very much, Norman. <laughs> Short and sweet. <laughs> and I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about your message. <laughs> but I'm sure you are too. <laughs> um, so shall we go on to any of our other panelists who would like to take a stab at the questions and those that are um, presented? I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll add to what, uh, what Norman has said. I think that there's a few things with, with uh, what's counting in our favor is that um, in many cases, we're creating new energy. So although we talk about a transition, um, apologies for the sensor light. <clears throat> although we talk about a transition, it, 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 it is a case of there is less of a move away from coal and rather a case that we have too little power. And certainly outside of South Africa, there's a, there's a critical need. Um, so so it, I think that, that is, um, that is a, a helpful aspect in that we're in, in most instances, we're creating new power rather than replacing existing power sources, which is maybe the case more in a, in a developed, uh, in a more developed setting. Um, but that being said, you know, we, we do, we do still have some communities that are very heavily invested uh, or dependent on, on coal. Um, and it is going to be very difficult to manage that process. You know, we, we've, we've, we're certainly better at opening minds than we are at closing them. Um, and, and you know, so we we still have uh, learning to do around uh, transitioning people towards closure, transitioning communities, um, and and that's something that has to happen in parallel with skilling people up to to move into um, in, into installing and and uh, creating a, a renewable energy supply base. Um, and then, as I said, I think I think what's uh, what is very exciting is I think we will see the potential as as a, co a comment around prosumers. I think that's where I get also get excited when I see mining companies installing hybrid plants 
you know you need a certain number of solar panels in a in a in a, in a country before there's a distributor um, before there's an installer before there's a a, a way to maintain a product before there's there's switch uh, switches that that you require so, so i think as you see these large customers um, create that that consumer base create the the fact now there is an agent for panels now there is an agent for uh, for wind turbines now there are spare gearboxes in country I think as that, that critical mass rolls out, then we see that, that opportunity for those prosumers, the people at a relatively small scale, um, to start to adapt and, and, and invest. And, and most of that transition is, is fairly positive, but we do have to be very careful around managing the, the negative aspects and, and keeping people caught into the process. Uh, Thanks. Go first, no, 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 I was gonna say, I think that's a very sensible uh, input from you there, uh, Andrew. We do yeah. need to manage. In fact, uh, we did a study recently where we were talking about brown industries and we realized people would be offended if we use that word. But we were referring to traditional, conventional businesses that have, you know, for a long time because the resources been there, depended on, on, on coal. And uh, there's lots of, you know, regime change necessary, I suppose to think differently about the new source of energy that you're talking about. Over to you, Keith. <laughs> uh, Buyo, you, you go first, Buyo. Uh, so you, you carry on. I'll go, I'll go last. Sorry. <laughs> okay, no, no, no worries. Thanks, 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 Keith. Sorry, uh, I, I was just looking to sort of uh, bridge the gap between uh, Norman and Andrew's statements, which were more to uh, do with uh, um, kind of the prosumer or the smaller scale um, producer of electricity to uh, uh, more utility scale programs. So um, we, for instance, uh, uh, bridge that, uh, that, that divide somewhat in that uh, um, in East Africa, we're an investor in uh, prosumer businesses that uh, do rooftop solar um, for individual households in areas where um, there isn't necessarily a widespread uh, um, grid um, for consumers and all the way to large um, utility scale projects in the likes of South Africa. I think it's important to mention that uh, uh, Norman spoke to prosumers in rural areas of, uh, of, 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 of the continent. And in South Africa, we have um, lots of the large scale utility renewable energy projects located in places like the Eastern Cape, in the Northern Cape, uh, et cetera which are places um, where typically there has been no power supply previously. And in terms of um, ensuring that the communities around those projects um, embrace those projects, um, I think uh, the Department of uh, Mineral Re DMRE has been quite, uh, quite, 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 uh, quite adept at ensuring that those projects, um, both in employment creation, but also through some of the social benefits through uh, social and economic development spending, enterprise development spending as well, are seen as being part of those communities from a sustainability perspective. So uh, there are provisos in the REI triple P process, for instance, for the amount of money that has to go into enterprise development in the area surrounding uh, the various projects. And maybe just to give an example, I mean, we have a project, for instance, in, um, in the Northern Cape where the community immediately around that project doesn't have electricity, but you've got this huge um, renewable project that's supplying other parts of the country. Um, it's obviously not sustainable to have the, a large power project um, supplying other parts of the country when uh, the community in which that power station is located don't have power. So uh, in embracing or seeking to have the, the, the community around that project embrace the project. Um, we've obviously uh, initiated a street lighting project. Um, we've initiated uh, some sort of rooftop type uh, solar projects that at least provide some level of solace uh, to the communities around the projects in addition to uh, some of the early um, employment they, they, they could create by being in those communities. So uh, yeah, the embrace of communities is very important project sustainability. Thank you very much for that, Fuyo. I think, uh, all right, let me give um, 
keep the chance and then we, we can talk, we can wrap it up. No, I just want to say it's such a great question because I remember when I was physically at a conference, I think it was a NIA conference, um, they, they were speaking about the same thing. Well, similar, I got to give this example. It was done in India, right? Where they tried a decentralized approach for the community. And, and what happened was the, the, what the panelists said was, you know, the community got up and they said they don't want this, uh, I think it was fake energy, they called it, fake solar energy. And that is just such an example about how, you know, you kind of, you kind of don't understand there's a, there's a difference between what society sees and how he's utilizing power versus how you utilize renewable power, especially if you go from a, to a, towards a decentralized approach. And, and I agree with all of the panelists, and I just want to uh, highlight one thing, uh, I think it was Andrew was speaking about, is engagement. You know, it's, there's, you know if, if I had to say anything, what, 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 what is it that we have to do? You have to engage society. And this engagement, it, you know, I feel it's more than just giving them, you know, uh, power or giving them energy efficient solutions but an engagement that actually happens where you start to educate people really about why we're doing this, where we're actually going about, and, 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 and if using a decentralized approach, how even the equipment that you're using downstream needs to be like this, and, or, or if you're going for a DC type equipment. And, and, that, and, that, and for me, the question is, how do we engage? Because that is really the challenge inside our country, because I feel, I've never seen us get it 100% right. The balance between private and public needs to be strengthened in order to engage with society. I, I believe that, 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 that is important. And to touch on the last one that you were speaking about is, how do you get them to embrace the change? Because even, you know, and that engagement really comes out throughout, that, throughout, throughout, throughout your questions, you know. It's an engagement in terms of at a start, and even showing them the benefits, because that is the one thing I can't understand, you know, renewable energy, energy efficiency is, is something that, that can pay itself off. So, they, so it, it, it has the ability in itself to, to, to improve our lives. And uh, definitely that engagement piece, how we engage, how do you get the guys together is something that uh, I think needs a lot more thought. I don't think I'll be able to answer that. Well, um, gentlemen, and I'm going to say very pointedly, gentlemen, because <laughs> I'm the only lady here. Um, I, I'm not going to resist the opportunity to say something about women, since that's the work I'm doing right now. Um, when we're talking about embracing and all these other nice words we've used, uh, I'm also making a case that it's time a long time coming actually, that women also see themselves as part of this enabling force that we've spoken about and take the opportunities that are presented. And I think COVID-19 has shown us that not all work needs to be underground or in funny places that some women might not want to go, but it does, when we talk about embracing and if we're talking about inclusivity of women, it does mean that we have to also look at women differently. What are the needs of women in terms of energy? And what's their role that we need to think up front when we think about infrastructure development, buildings, uh, office work, front, front end users, and all the work that have, have become commonplace in, in, in the past year. Um, maybe just in summing up, and you know, if we, I hope there's no one, if there's anyone that still has the last word to say because I'm coming to a point of closing the session. Is there anyone who would like to say one last point before we close? Because I'm just going to sum up a few things that I've heard from the two sessions. Anyone? All right, I'm taking it. Okay. Uh, you're all good. All right. So from the previous session, three words that came out, because uh, I'm just trying to pull them together. Uh, I think three words that came out were the fact that when we're talking about sustainable energy going forward, we're talking about more decentralized model of energy uh, supply and demand. We're talking about democratization. And the one word that we didn't use in this session, but I think it's worth using because it might be something to think about 
from a renewable energy perspective is that of digitization. We've all had to survive in the past year on digitization in one form or another. So how does it fit in? What does digitization do for us in the renewable energy space? And then I think uh, keeping with alphabet here, I think words that I've heard from this session, uh, and I'm going to draw one from the pre also from the previous session, uh, education. I think, you know, we talk a lot about awareness raising, but I think the points that I think a number of you have raised is the question of how much do people really understand? How much are we really engaging? And maybe it's education and engagement. What do we mean by engagement? Because it's one thing to say you stood on a podium and spoke to a thousand people and told them, but is that really engaging? You know, did you really bring people along with you and show them as you, as this panel has indicated, have we shown them the benefits to themselves? And I think the other word is experimentation, which came from the previous group, that you know, because we're saying we need to catch up and we need to move fast, there's some things that one might have to experiment with because we're not sure what's going to work. So some of us will have to take a few chances and experiment with, with something that's totally new. And the word embracing has been used in both sessions. And I suppose when you think about embracing, you think about something being done with care and something being done you know, with willingness. So how do we um, ensure that in moving forward uh, and using a renewable energy as part of our economic recovery, we get people to embrace the change, people that might be opposed to it, people that might not see the point in it, people that might not see the opportunity in it, people that might see more of the challenge in it than the opportunity in it. How do we do that? And I think that's a question we perhaps, I think we've answered that question um, in both panels. We've given some ideas about that. But I think it's still food for a lot more thoughts. And lastly, the word consumers, I think, cuts across uh, both panels, but I think it was brought up, especially in this panel. Uh, the, the whole notion that our, as human beings, um, we are much more demanding now. We are on-demand society. Uh, even in the rural communities, I'm sure, if you give people half a chance, people want a, the choice, the freedom of choice to put their demands forward for themselves. And we, are, we become a society, especially through COVID and lockdowns and so on, that wants things and we want things now. So we've learned that we can Uber and we can have things electronically provided for us. And the same may apply to energy, that we may say, well, I will choose what kind of energy I want. And how do we respond to people who previously were not part of the debate? Uh, they're not represented always in some of our formal structures, but suddenly they realize, or well, there is the opportunity for them to now be part of the process. And um, yeah, I think the life cycle question that I asked is one that I think we may maybe worth having further debates in the future, because I guess that's a, an important question uh, these days, there's a lot of talk in government circles about a circular economy. So as we talk about renewable energy, let's also talk about, you know, to what extent does it feed into the notion of a circular economy? But I think enough from me, I'd like to thank um, all the panelists for being available and for being willing to share your thoughts. And as I said, although you, you had less time, I think you've done a great job of sharing your thoughts in very succinct terms. And uh, I'm looking forward to further engagements amongst you, and also to any of the audience or other people who are not here. I hope they pick up on your messages and make contact with you in terms of the areas of work that you are busy with. Uh, in the absence of seeing the audience, may I give you a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie, for being quite um, strong in facilitating both panel discussions. But I've uh, noted that it's a passion of yours, um, especially when it comes to, you know, the green economy, sustainable development, uh, not just only where people are concerned, but where women are concerned and where they participate. So thank you very, very much uh, for facilitating both of the panel discussions uh, for us. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you. My pleasure. Goodbye. Take good care.
Well, folks, there you have it. That was the renewable energy as a driver of economic recovery. We've noted that it is possible if certainly we put our heads together and solidify strategies um, that could you know, aid us in um, developing this area, uh, particularly not just from a government perspective, but public-private uh, partnership. So those inputs will be noted, and uh, we certainly look forward to implementing some of the suggestions uh, that were made. Thank you greatly for your participation. Please don't forget to hashtag SAS Summit 2020, add your comments, your recommendations, and uh, we do apologize for all the technical errors that we had earlier on, but hey, it's all uh, in the name of the game. Um, one thing that we can take away today is that we can't just consume our way to a more sustainable world, but um, we must be involved in production. So tomorrow we will have a very engaging session. We'll be meeting at the same time and also at the same place right here online, and we'll be talking about sustainable infrastructure development as well as the vision net zero waste particularly in packaging so do uh, join us tomorrow at nine o'clock so that we can stick, uh, kick start the program and um, we also have another amazing uh, panel of speakers and also a lovely welcome addresses from various uh, stakeholders in different industries so if you're an entrepreneur and also you are from an organization or a different company, please do continue to stay tuned for the next two days. But well done for making it today. Don't forget to stay safe. Um, we're not uh, done with the pandemic. We're still within it. So sanitize, put on your mask, do whatever you can to ensure that your, healthy and safe, your health and safety comes first. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in. We will see you uh, tomorrow again. Please don't forget to, just before you log off, visit our exhibition, 3D Exhibition Expo, and uh, do engage uh, with the exhibitors so that you can stand a chance to win. We will be announcing the winners between tomorrow and the last day. Thank you very much for your time. Do take care.